Greetings from Woods Chapel United Methodist Church. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message. We invite you to worship with us. Our Sunday worship times are 8 a.m., 9.05 a.m., 10.10 a.m., 11.15 a.m., and 5 o'clock p.m. We are located off Highway 291 between Woods Chapel Road and Lakewood Boulevard in Lee Summit, Missouri. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach us at 816-795-8848, extension 321. We hope you find this message meaningful and relevant in your daily life. Soviet leader professes faith in God. Former communist leader Mikhail Gorbachev publicly acknowledged his Christian faith for the first time on March 19th during a visit to the tomb of St. Francis in Italy. He spent about a half hour in prayer. Catholic World News reported Mr. Gorbachev, age 77, the Soviet Union's last president, was baptized as a child in the Russian Orthodox Church but had previously expressed only pantheistic views, telling one interviewer, Nature is my God, but today he joins his voice with yours and mine to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. And I just, I just thought that was worth sharing. Okay. Uh, let's stand for our scripture lesson, John 21, beginning with verse 4. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. The disciples did not realize it was him. He called out to them, friends, have you caught any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him. He jumped in the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish. They were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals. There were fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. The King James says, come and dine. Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and then did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Dear friends, this is the word of the Lord. May God send his Holy Spirit to bless it to our hearts as we gather in his name today. Please be seated. Well, I brought my fishing pole, and uh, we could talk for a long time about things this fishing pole has done and places it has been. Uh, I caught trout in Yellowstone Park illegally <laughs> when I was eight years old, and I didn't know. Uh, they tasted good. Uh, what do they say, Bill? It's easier to get forgiveness than permission? Yeah. Uh, Y'all all, all have seen the 100-pound catfish at Bass Pro? You want to know who caught that? So do I. <laughs> you, know, you know how much it costs to climb the rock wall there? Two dollars. Isn't that awesome? Two dollars. I ought to do that if I thought I could, but I don't think I will. I caught bass at the pond by Patio Quigley's before Patio Quigley's was there, fishing with Joe McMurtry. I caught bass in the Arbery's ponds with Doug Holly. I caught fish with Tom Bame at some gravel pits that are in some secret illegal part of the state, I'm sure. <laughs> Every canoe trip we've been on, I've caught smallmouth bass. And my favorite fishing story is the time we were canoeing and I was out in the boat and I got a bite. And it has a different feel to it, you know. And um, get this thing to the top, it's a gar, right? Big old alligator mouth guard. Now, when I say big, it wasn't that big, okay? It was about like, like that, right? <laughs> but it had a big old scary snout on that thing, you know, and they're just all teeth. And I, we're going to the shore. And so we go over to the shore and get out and I kind of pull that thing up. And I, I'm going, how's this thing going to get off of my hook? I have no idea. 
And about the time I reached down to, to grab, I probably had a pair of pliers. I was going to grab the, the lure and, you know, try to turn it and get him. He, he starts flopping around. It's like, whoo. <laughs> he flopped off the hook, back in the water, and away he went. That's my best fishing story. Uh, the main point of fishing is not who catches the first fish, 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 or the most fish. Uh, there's two things that are great about fishing. One of them is the people that you're with, right? And the other one is that you are out here in, in God's uh, wide open spaces. You know, on a canoe trip, when I'm wading out about knee high in the stream and, 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 and my line's in the water and I'm, I'm looking for a fish and the trees are out and, and it's a beautiful day, that's God's holy place. And before men and women built houses for people to worship in, that was the only sanctuary God has. And, and, and to be out and fish is an awesome thing. Uh, it's, it, it's an awesome time when uh, you can experience the presence of God. So uh, here we have the disciples that have caught 153 fish. And that's a pretty good story. They probably told that story the rest of their lives. But... Um, it's not really about the fish, is it? It's not really about uh, the fish. The point of the story is, is something other than the fish. But what do you suppose they did with them? Did they eat them all? I don't think so. Uh, did they pack them in a, a freezer truck and take them to Kansas City? They didn't have freezers. They had a very short amount of time in a non-freezer world to do something with these fish. I don't think they sold them and bought a home to retire in, which is sometimes what we do when we get more, we collect more and set aside more for ourselves. We don't know what they did with them, but it's a very interesting thought that given this whopping story of blessings, 153 fish, they have a very short time to do something with them. Oh, and I think of your life, and I think of my life, and we're here for however many years God gives us, but it's a short time, and we've been given all these blessings. What will we do with them? What will we do with the fish that, that, that our house is absolutely filled up with? And you know, sometimes we forget that God has blessed us in incredibly wonderful ways, um, the disciples had 153 blessings. We have, we have lots of, of blessings. And one of the things that, that the scriptures make clear about blessings is that there are responsibilities that come with them. Jesus said in Luke 12, to whomever much was given, much would be required. And I have people think they're not blessed. And they say, you know, if I won the lottery... The church would have no problems. You know, your church's problems are pretty small. They're pretty boring. But the thing that I want to say to all of you who think you're going to solve the church's problems if you win the lottery, you already won the lottery. If you live in America, you won the lottery. Our poorest people are richer than most of the people in the rest of the world. And the problem with us is that we don't see the blessings we drive to these wonderful homes and, and wonderful cars and, and we open the front door and hundreds of fish are falling out of the house just all over the sidewalk and we don't even see them. Do you remember when you, you bought that house and you were thinking, oh, it's my dream house. Oh, it will be so wonderful. Oh, it will be so good. God, please, I know you don't care about houses, but please let them accept our offer. Remember praying those prayers? And you moved in and you were so excited and it was so wonderful. And now a year later, it's just a house, right? You just forgot how wonderful it was. You got used to all that comfort. You got used to all that joy and glory. You remember when you were first in love? You were so excited about being in love. So excited. And then, you know, the honeymoon period was over. And so you sit in that house and you uh, say things to each other that you shouldn't. And we've forgotten 
that God has given us these wonderful blessings. We've been blessed so much, we don't even see them. We don't appreciate the blessings that God has given us. The disciples, they have nothing. They have nothing. So when they're blessed, they see God. They say, oh, God has blessed us. Look at the fish. Look, at it's Jesus. Something amazing has happened. We're so accustomed to being blessed that, that we think we deserve it. And when something goes wrong, we say, hey, God, how come my car won't start? And I think God says, Jeff, you have a car. This is terrible. You ever have that? I've got to sneeze. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> you know, if you lost everything, if suddenly you have nothing, no health, no friends, no one at your house to say, I still love you. Maybe no house. Maybe you're on the street. No car. That's when we begin to appreciate that God has blessed us. That's when we begin to understand that every single thing, every single fish that lives at our house, that exists in our world, these are all things that God has, has given us, not simply for us to consume but those are things that, that ought to cause us to see Jesus. If you leave here today and your car starts, you should say, thank God. God, thank you for a car that starts. If it's a cold day and you have heated seats, you should really thank God. <laughs> you know, when you're driving on roads and they have a few potholes because the winter's just over and they're not fixed yet. But you know, when was the last time you drove around and said, God, thank you for my neighborhood? When was the last time you made a list of people that you love and said, God, thank you? Man, our nets are full. Our boats are sinking from all the blessings and, and we've forgotten to say thank you. We've forgotten it's time to paddle the shore and find Jesus. Spend some time with him. Blessings point us to the giver. Not too long ago, uh, a dear friend in our church wrote me a note and said, uh, I'd like for you to talk sometime about what blessings Christians can ask for. And I'm going to start with telling you what blessings I think you should not ask for. My wife is a KU Jayhawk fan. <laughs> God doesn't care about basketball games. He just doesn't. I'm not sure God cares what neighborhood you live in. You can pray for health, but the scriptures don't promise us that we'll always be healthy. We can worry about earthly things. We can worry about worldly things and we can pray for more of them. But I want to tell you today, that's not the point of the Christian faith. The point of the Christian faith is not us collecting more things. There are pastors on TV, forgive me. If, they list, if you listen to them, what they are saying is, if you have enough faith, God will give you whatever you ask for. It's not true, and it's not what the Christian faith is about. It's not about us accumulating things. It's not about us having a comfortable life. I heard one man a couple of months ago said, uh, you shouldn't be satisfied with a job at the company. You should be praying to be the owner of the company. And I thought, how does that work? Everyone's the owner, and, and no one works for the company. A lot of times what I end up hearing when I listen carefully to these ministries is send us money 
and you'll be blessed financially and I hope you smell the stinky fish in that line. You know, don't be fooled. Uh, I mean, you need to exercise wisdom when you listen to preachers, even this one. Because the Christian faith is not about us getting more stuff. Paul was uh, clear. Paul was rude about this, in fact. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. If anyone teaches false doctrines and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, listen, listen to all the adjectives. Listen to this big buildup here. Uh, that person is conceited and under, understands nothing. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and think that godliness is a means to financial gain. The Christian faith was never about us getting stuff. But godliness with contentment is great, great gain. We brought nothing into this world. We can take nothing from it. If we have food and clothing, we should be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, I want you to have dreams. I want you to fulfill your potential. John Wesley said, make all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. Don't shortchange your life because it sounds like the preacher doesn't think you should be interested in things. I'm not saying that. Fulfill your potential. Dream your dreams. Let God use you. But understand, if you got 153 fish in your net, we ought to be praising God and we ought to realize we can't eat them all ourselves. We've got to be giving that stuff away. My wife's not here. I'm going to tell you a story about my wife. You know, she's a good lady. Uh, the Dave Ramsey thing was going around and we were having a discussion after that was over about how much my wife was going to have to spend every pay period. And without surprise, with no surprise, what Jeff thought Kathy should have to spend and what Kathy thought Kathy should have to spend were two different amounts. Now, of course, you know who won. Of course, Kathy won. But, but you know why I gave up that argument? It's because when I said to her, what will you do with that? She said, Jeff, I run into people that need help and I want to help them. Woo! Woo! That's a good woman. That's a good woman. And you know, that's the heart that God is looking for. This amazing thing happens when the net starts to fill up with fish. Their eyes open and they say, oh my gosh, that's Jesus. And they get over to the side and they gather with him and they sit down around the fire and they eat a meal. You know, the best part of any fishing trip I've ever been on uh, is, is sitting around the fire, is telling the stories, it's, it's, it's eating the food, it's being with the people that we love. And, 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 and the point of this story is that it's not about the fish, it's about the Savior. He's risen from the dead. This is the third time that he's appeared to them. And he's saying, come and dine. Come gather with me. Come fellowship with me. You know, friends, as long as our lives are about the fish, the outcome of that is predictable. Unhappiness and sorrow and one wanting after the next. But when our heart truly becomes to be about wanting a relationship with Jesus Christ, Oh, there's joy. Oh, there is contentment. Oh, there is, is, is happiness and, and celebration in the big things and in the small things and the opportunities that we have to share his love and to give that, that love away to others. It's not ever, was never intended to be about the fish, but those things ought to turn us to God that we call on his name. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you that we can ask for every blessing. 
We thank you the most for the spiritual blessings, the love that we share one with another, the forgiveness that we receive from you, the promise of, lo, I am with you always, the promise that you have sent a comforter, the promise that you are preparing a place for us. We thank you that we truly are spiritual beings on a spiritual journey. We thank you for the joy that we know because we love you. Help us live our lives in a way that bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.